is Mile High Stadium, July 17th. Michigan quarterback Bobby Abier became the MVP in the championship game with passes like this one. 48-yard touchdown, Anthony Carter. Today, the defending champion Michigan Panthers are back in search of the goal. A crowd of nearly 50,000 is expected here today. From Mile High Stadium in Denver, Colorado, it's the third week of the United States Football League. Today, it's the defending champion Michigan Panthers against Craig Morton's undefeated Denver Gold. Who I 
just mentioned out of Ohio State, spent most of last year with the Arizona Wranglers, and it's that last second surge right there that gets him the yardage. I thought he had come up short, but you can see that he makes the move forward at the last moment there, pushes the ball forward, and picks up the valuable yardage and gets the goal the first down. That you know, is one of the advantages of having a head coach who is an experienced NFL quarterback or pro quarterback. First down from the 28, and again it's Harry Sidney. Good blocking on the right side. Bangs his way across the 32 to the 33 yard line. John Corker is there to pull him down. This is the guy known as the Sack Man, one of the premier linebackers in the USFL in 1983. And look at the pursuit. He's 6'6, 230 pounds, and look at it. He plays wall to wall linebacker. That man does. He had 28 and a half sacks. In 1983, the USFL Defensive Player of the Year, John Gorker. Look at Jim Stanley. John Ardell comes to the bottom of the screen. The top of Leonard Harris. Second and six from the 32. Henry to throw. for them, Victor Hicks, watch it, play action, fake, face to Sydney. he's on the left and he's running an out route toward the sideline, he gets into the open area right there, gets behind David Greenwood, the safety man, and with a nice soft looping trajectory, Craig Penrose gets the ball into the open area for a 20-yard pickup, the goals are off to a great start, and Harris comes out, Kevin Williams comes in along with Elmo Bailey, they get two wide outs, first down from the 47. Receiver for them during training camp. Starts in motion to the right. Comes up 
the 33, shotgun formation. Let's 
be the best, but the four years it doesn't take long to call roll. Took him seven games last year to make 13 receptions. He had 13 coming into this game. He's got one here this afternoon. First and 10 from the 40 
point. And the ball is thrown perfectly. He should never drop this pass. Tom Sullivan is close by, but that certainly should have been a touchdown. And that's the kind of thing that coaches hate. Quarterbacks hate it in the end. Cobb hates it himself. He's going to hate to watch that on the field.
block him out, which lets Bentley come free. That's what sets it up. Actually, that's a very important point because it's a teamwork play defensively, and it's just as important as what a passer and a wide receiver do. There is a Terrific. We're down to 7.32 first quarter. 
This one's over. Tyrone McGriff showed his experience there, though. Before he came back to another lick, he went to get his own. Good idea. These are two teams that are very physical. They are not intimidated by one another. The Denver goal had a reputation as being one of the most physical teams in the league last year. The declaration by Dave Kaminsky. The referee. running a deep curl-in route, and number 23, Nate Miller, is right there to make the tackle. But look at the hand-eye coordination, the concentration as he's hit hard and he goes down to the ground. Out of Arkansas, he was overshadowed by Gary Anderson in publicity there, but there was a real sweeper for the Panthers in 1983, and he's continued here in 1984. The goal drop off show man-to-man coverage from the 42. First down, the give is to Miller. And Cleo takes it to the left side, picks up some good blocks, and rambles down to the 37-yard line before Nate Miller pulls him down there. Gets confusing, doesn't it? Cleo Miller, Terry Miller, Nate Miller. You got Millers all over the place. Both fine athletes. Terry Miller, 5'10", 196 pounds, as you should cup, out of Oklahoma State. Played for Jim Stanley uh, at Oklahoma State at one point. As you pointed out, runner-up for the Heisman Trophy behind Earl Campbell in 1977. In his rookie season, Terry Miller gained over 1,000 yards for the 
the Buffalo Bills. We're, we're talking about Siri Miller. That's Cleo Miller there out of Arkansas. Fifth all-time rusher for the Cleveland Browns. Ten-year better. Second and six from the 38 in the crowd. Defense inside and over. Miller breaks it inside the 30 to the 26-yard line. Good speed for those times. So it is interesting to note that the normal starting backfield of Williams and Lacey replaced today by the Miller boys. They don't lose a whole lot. They don't lose a whole lot with the Cleo Miller and Terry Miller. Big, strong, bruising running backs. John Williams out with a screen tackle. Ken Lacey at home. He thought he would be here today. He wanted to play. He wanted to take it and go on if the game was tight. He thought we'd see him. He didn't make the trip. Critical drive for the Michigan Panthers, leading seven and nothing. They're threatening again. Now keep in mind, Cupper Denver had its opportunities early. They moved the ball twice, and now they've got to stop Michigan here. This is an important point in the football game for the Denver Bulls. The crowd here yelling, "Defense! Defense!" It's been an eight-minute drive. Third and two from the seven across the middle is Cobb down to the one. That's Don Eccles, replacing Mike Cobb, and he's down to the one-yard line. Hey, Bears pass is complete to Don Eccles, the Panthers. Tight end Don Eccles lining up on the left. Oh, inside release, he's going on a crossing route. He's the underneath man. A Bear throws the ball with nice touch. And number 21, David Dumars, one of the outstanding athletes in the secondary for the gold, makes the tackle and pushes him back. You know what they did, Cupper? They came in with two tight ends. And Don Eccles, the Oklahoma State product, who played for Jim Stanley there, came in and ran the little drag pattern. Good play. Had me confused. First and goal from the two. Again, everybody in tight. Power formation. Old line defense by the goal. Miller, close. No signal yet. Terry Miller, 
of the ball carrier. Second and goal. Runs off tackle right in behind Ray Finney and Tony Osmond. Number 74 and 75. Good power play off that right side. I thought momentarily that he was in there. There's the beef. Ray Penny, 256. Tony Osmond, 255. Ball inside the one-yard line. It's a big offensive line. It goes 250, 267, 265, 256, and 255. Second and goal. The nose of the ball, almost touching the goal line. Quarterback sneak by Bear. Still no signal. Good penetration on defense by Pat Olgren. No, sir. That brings the crowd to its feet. Going to be third and inches. And the Michigan Panthers want timeout to talk this one over. So the Denver Gold have raised their back. Strong defense at the goal line. The score remains the same, 7-0. The Panthers have gone 80 yards in 15 plays. It's third and inches with 25 seconds in the half. The crowd wants defense. So does Craig Morton. The give. Miller, touchdown, Panthers. What a drive that was, taking up over 10 minutes. The first drive took up 6 minutes and 57 seconds. So what Michigan has done is exactly what they like to do. They have controlled the football and have really been in charge of the clock. Watch the blocking on the left side. Tyrone McGriff, Chris Godfrey. Here comes Terry Miller on the power play. There's Tyrone pulling, and he's right in behind. What a smack there by the lead block by number 33, fullback Cleo Miller on number 21, David Dumars. Number three, Novo Bajovic to attempt the extra point. Bad snap. He still gets it up, and it's good. The extra point is good. By Trouble Novo. with the snap, but yeah. Novo Bajovic is now two for two on the extra points, and the Michigan Panthers have taken a 14-0 lead with 22 seconds remaining in the half. Leonard Harris is the deep man for the Denver Gold. He is flanked by John Arnold and Anthony Allen. Leonard Harris, 5'8", 185-pound speed strata, Texas Tech. Novo Bajovic will kick it away, number three. He's from Tito Grad, Yugoslavia, and went to school with Central Michigan here in the United States. Notice what's on his left hand, a glove filled with garlic. I want to know why. Short kick. Allen, 25-30, picks up a block across the 20, rather, into the 22-yard line. Well, it's to keep the vampires away. I mean, anybody would know that. The garlic, the garlic keeps the, keeps the vampires out of the stadium. I'll guarantee he's not very popular in the locker room. 14 nothing. 16 seconds remaining in the first half. So now it's up to Craig Penrose in the Denver Gold to try to get something on the board here in a hurry, but they don't have much time to do it. So they split everybody out wide. Bottom of your screen is Leonard Harris. Andrew Bailey goes to the top. And now in motion. From the 23, Penrose goes underneath to Bo Matthews. Matthews can't get out of bounds to stop the clock. Would be a yard shy of a first down. And that could be the first. It is. It's a timeout. the Michigan Panthers. Why would the Michigan Panthers take a timeout? I think the official must be making a mistake. That has to be gold. Has to be. Michigan, very impressive after faltering in their first possession. The second possession, they went uh, for a touchdown and used up six minutes and 57 seconds on the clock. On that last drive, they used up nine minutes and 42 seconds. So they have been in control of the ball and in control of the ball game. Up on the field right now. Active linebacker for the Michigan Panthers. Last play of the half, Craig Penrose, shotgun formation. Penrose puts it up for grabs, hoping for a deflection. Instead, it is intercepted by David Greenwood, and that's the end of the half. 
So, two very long drives by the Panthers, and that's the difference. We'll be back with today's halftime activities after this message and a word from our local stations. I'm Jim Lampley at ABC Sports Control in New York. Welcome again at halftime with you, those of you who are watching the Michigan-Denver game. Let's bring you up to date on what's happening elsewhere in the United States Football League. First of all, in the Jersey Meadowlands, it is tied up at 7-7 between the New Jersey Generals and the Philadelphia Stars. The Generals scored first in this ballgame after a long drive in which they effectively mixed the running of fullback Maurice Carthen and Herschel Walker. It was Carthen who got the touchdown on a one-yard run, and the Generals led at that point 7-0. But then, with a long drive, 16 plays, 78 yards, Philly came back to score on this spectacular Willie Collier catch of a seven-yard chuck. You've seen a pass. It is 7-7 right now, and they're late in the second quarter, Philadelphia and New Jersey. Down in New Orleans, in the Superdome. You already know that Marcus Dupree scored a touchdown in his very first professional carry. Right now, it is 14-14 in that ball game. Let's take a look at how they got to that juncture, 14-14. Of course, this was Dupree's first United States Football League carry. One yard out, the arms in the air, the touchdown. It was 7-0 New Orleans. That was set up by a Ben Needham fumble recovery, and Marcus's teammates were quite happy for the newcomer. Alan Reed came back to score in a 15-yard run for Memphis, which tied it back up at 7-7. But then Dupree had the answer again as New Orleans once again got in the scoring position and this time from two yards out, Marcus on the same play, sweep right, scored again. It was seven or 14-7, favor of Dick Curry's New Orleans Breakers. But then late in the second period, Walter Lewis, who has started off hot for the Memphis Showboats, threw this 30-yard touchdown pass to Cormac Carmi formerly from UCLA. Carney's touchdown made it 14-14 as the breakers and the showboats are tied up. Elsewhere, Houston and Chicago, Jim Kelly having another good game, two touchdown passes for the Gamblers, and they lead the Blitz 24-16. San Antonio and Oklahoma, a 30-yard interception return for Lee Wilson has made it 7-0 in favor of the Outlaws. Birmingham and Pittsburgh, a lot of interesting personalities in this game. Mike Rozier once again moving slowly. Six carries, 14 yards, one fumble before the sellout crowd of 57,000 in Three Rivers Stadium. The fumble set up a Joe Cribbs touchdown, which has given Birmingham an 18-3 lead. Cribs 10 carries for 54 yards and a TD in the game. Cliff Stout returning to the scene of his year as quarterback of the Steelers this past year in Three Rivers Stadium is one for six for only 23 yards in the air for Birmingham. Doesn't need to throw it much though as the Stadions are on top in that one 18-3. Later in the day the Los Angeles Express will be at Oakland to play the Invaders. Steve Young's debut in an Express uniform will have to wait at least another week. He won't play today. And coming up immediately following this commercial message, we're going to be bringing you a story about the new box office darlings of the United States Football League, the team that drew a sellout today in Three Rivers Stadium, the Pittsburgh Maulers. Blue Collar, a shot and beer place. But today, it is a city with a new image. Not steel mills, but steel and glass skyscrapers and almost three million people. And during its 20 years of transition, Pittsburgh has remained an avid football town. The Steelers of Mr. Art Rooney, Harris, Green, Swan, and Bradshaw are household names here. But now the city has begun a romance with the Pittsburgh Maulers of the United States Football League. One of the six expansion franchises in 1984, this afternoon the Maulers are making history. Their first game in Three Rivers Stadium is a paid sellout without promotions or giveaways. More than 57,000 tickets sold. It came as a surprise. Not even the president of the Maulers expected a full house. Well, we're a little bit surprised that we were able to sell out. Some people are. Uh, there were various predictions as to how many season tickets we would sell and how many people we would have at our opening game. But we were able to, early on with our marketing surveys, identify a... a a demographic of people who have been precluded from season tickets in this market obviously because of the Steelers. The Steelers began to sell out in 1973 and if you wanted to see them live uh, you couldn't do that. The Maulers were not an immediate box office attraction. The stadium lease wasn't approved until late November, and by early January, only 6,000 season tickets had been sold. But things changed dramatically when owner Edward DeBartolo signed Heisman Trophy winner Mike Rozier to a multi-million dollar contract. Rozier gave the Maulers instant acceptance, instant credibility. Suddenly, there were long lines at the ticket window. 5,000 season tickets sold in a week. 
Advertisements urge people to buy their way into future sellouts now. Flashy television commercials said the same. It's coming. March 1984. USFL action comes to Pittsburgh. The Maulers' historic first season at Three Rivers. Call 642-2067 and be a part of Pittsburgh sports history. Today's sellout in Pittsburgh and the Mauler sale of nearly 20,000 season tickets is quite an accomplishment for an expansion franchise. Right now, the Maulers are a curiosity. But if any town is willing to support a team built around one big-name player and a coach whose name is Joe Pendry, it may just be Pittsburgh. The question is the same in every USFL city. It may be easiest to answer here. Will Pittsburgh support the Maulers? We have to do a lot of positive things. I mean, we have to create pleasant experiences at Three Rivers for the people who come to see our games. Uh, a love affair doesn't happen instantaneously. I think the fans are going to wait and see. Uh, the credibility to this franchise has been established, and certainly Ed DeBartolo had an awful lot to do with that. Now the team has to perform. We have a sellout Sunday. We are encouraged with the volume of our season ticket sales. And with the picking up of the economy, we, we think it will last. But certainly we have to be respectable and we have to play the hard-nosed, tough type of professional football that the football fans in, in Pittsburgh are used to. As you look at the halftime stats, remember how we talked about the time of possession numbers? Look now, 18 to 12, and in total yards now, 141 to 99. But something that's not shown there that is extremely important in terms of third down efficiency, Michigan is six of seven in third down conversions. Denver is only two of five. That's why they've been able to hold on to the football. That's why they've been in charge here in the first half. I understand that Jim Stanley had quite a week of practice. He was very upset last week when the offense gave up 17 points in that ball game. And also the special teams had two punts blocked in the first two games and they had none blocked last year so he actually went after them pretty hard this week very tough week of practice and evidently they are responding they practiced of course inside the weather has been very bad in Michigan they practiced inside the Silver Dome they are playing outside now on natural turf that's the kicker for the Denver Gold Brian Spielman he's out of Capitol College 5'11", 185 pounds the deep men that will receive for the Michigan Panthers on the right is Walter Bouton, number 24 out of Jacksonville State. Bobby Futrell, a speedster out of Elizabeth City. Yeah, Elizabeth City, and that where Johnny Walton coached. Absolutely. And played quarterback of the New Orleans Breakers. Threw for nearly 4,000 yards last year when he was with the Boston Breakers. And was sacked only eight times, a league low. Not a high kick, but it is a long one. And Bouton takes it three, four yards deep in the end zone and very wisely elects not to run it out. So the Michigan Panthers will have it first. Let me set that offensive line up for you. The quarterback is still Bobby A. Bear. The running backs, Cleo Miller and Terry Miller. The tight end is Mike Cobb. He'll be number 90, 89, rather. Caught a pass in 23 consecutive ball games. The offensive line... Tony Osmond, Ray Penny, Wayne Radloff, Tyrone McGriff, Chris Godfrey in the wideouts, Derek Holloway, and Anthony Carter. How you doing today? First and 10, Michigan from the 20. Holloway and Carter, the bottom of your screen. Twins to the right side, now Carter goes in motion. Miller across the 30 to the 35-yard line, or the 25-yard line, rather. to give them 10 yards. Picking up right where they left off in the second quarter. Hoping to dominate with a good tackle to tackle running game and eat up the clock. They've got a nice lead now. They would like ideally, Tim, to freeze the football. And I think this is going to be an important defensive sequence right now for the goal because certainly the momentum in the second quarter turned in favor of Michigan. That goal defense, Dave Stoll, Pat Ogren, Calvin Turner, the three men up front. Greg Durkin. Jeff Harper, John Bungarts, and Kelvin Newton are the linebackers. This is Cleo Miller. Cleo Miller gets a block and turns it loose up to the 35-yard line. David Dumars and Kelvin Newton make the stop there. The defensive secondary, a good one for Denver. David Martin, David Dumars, Tom Sullivan, and Nate Miller. David Martin, David Dumars, both all pro last year in their first USFL season. 
Cleo Miller really running that left side that time with a lot of intensity. A lot of up and down moves. He had the wiggle. He's here to play. 11 yards on that one. 10 now. 10 carries now for 60 yards on the day for Cleo Miller out of the University of Arkansas. Spent a lot of season for the Cleveland Browns. He only had two carries coming into this ball game for nine yards and one touchdown. First and 10 from the 36. A Bear going long, looking for Holloway. Incomplete. The Denver fans look for a flag, but there is none. Nate Miller, number 23, was the defensive back out there. He wants offensive pass interference call. That's the kind of play where you almost always see a flag. Bobby A Bear. He's going deep. You know it right away. Seven-step drop. Looks to his left. Makes a good move to his left, and he's aiming for Derek Holloway. Now watch along the left sideline and see if indeed Derek Holloway does push off. You can't get a real good look at it there, but it appeared that there might have been offensive pass interference. A Bear threw that ball 57 yards in the air. He's now 10 of 19 for 95 yards. Carter in motion. A Bear to throw again on second and 10. Drops it over the middle. Mike Cobb, the tight end, takes it across the 40 to the 41-yard line, and he is met there by some big horses. Kelvin Newton, Big Matthews. Let's go downstairs now to Bob Bruce. Tim, Craig Penrose is still warming up behind me, but he's just informed me he will not return for the first offensive series for Denver. That means that Ron Reeves will now be the quarterback because Bob Galliano is on the developmental squad, and they don't want to play him because then they can't put him back on that squad. Another injury note for Michigan, John Arnod, free safety, is out for the rest of the game, a shoulder and rib problem. Back up to Tim and Lee. Okay, so Penrose sits down. Ron Reeves, the two-year veteran out of Texas Tech, will be the quarterback when the goal will get the ball. But first, they have to stop Michigan. Third and four, Panthers from the 42. This is penalty cup. Delay of the game, I bet. If that's the case, the clocks are wrong. We have a false start on the 70, the offense. Shows how much I know. Well, they had three seconds on the 30-second clock, but it was Chris Gottfried who moved a little bit. Chris Gottfried, the left tackle, 6'4", 250-pounder out of Michigan. Tim, I think we should restate for some of the folks that might be joining us late that Craig Penrose spent some time in the hospital earlier this week. He's had the flu, had congestion, fever, feeling uh, generally run down, and he looked lethargic, I felt, in, in warm-ups, but he had a fairly good first half statistically. Uh, however, he admitted earlier that he was weak. Six defensive backs for the goal. McLean in motion. This is 39. A Bear with pressure. The blitz is on. And A Bear goes down. Daryl Hemphill makes the sack. They use six defensive backs. They brought Hemphill, number 25, through clearly. West Texas State, 6'1, 195 pounder, and he was untouched. Oh, this is this is something I remember well. Now watch Hemphill number 25. Well it's it's Tom Sullivan, the free safety, and Hemphill. We got both safeties coming that time. It's a double safety blitz. That's a gutsy call, especially against a passing team like Michigan. It looks like the block is on. Everybody loads up front for the goal. David Greenwood to punt it away. He's got a 41-yard average, hangs this one high and low near the sideline. David Martin picks up four. On the return, and he's knocked out of bounds there. So the Denver goal will have the ball when we come back, and the new quarterback is Ron Reeves. Michigan Panthers set up their defense. The new quarterback for the Denver Gold is Ron Reeves. Played last year with the Montreal Concords in the CFL. Has not thrown a pass in this league. 
Malone set back. Harry Sidney, his first pass, now complete. Vincent White across midfield. So his first pass is complete. David Greenwood, John Corker make the stop. That's got to make Reeves feel very comfortable. 6'2", 215 pounder out of Texas Tech. That's a good way to build your confidence. Come right out with a, a hitch pattern or any of the underneath routes. This is a guy who has not thrown a pass, yet not thrown a pass until that one for the Denver Gold, but played a lot last year up in Canada, had a good career at Texas Tech, and one of his receivers there was his wide receiver here, number 80, Leonard Harris. Two tight ends, the lone wide receiver, Elmer Bale at bottom of your screen, the give, Vincent White, looks for help, doesn't find it, gives up the football, the Michigan Panthers say they have it. And they do. Turnover, Denver, the Panthers get it back. Big number 98, Alan Hughes comes up with the football, shows it to us. He's 6'3", 260 pounder. And when he says he's got the ball, very few people will take it away from him. <laughs> Not too many folks can argue with that big guy. Nose tackle, Alan Hughes, number 88, uh, 98. John Banasak was the man that made the hit. He's out of Eastern Michigan, another Pittsburgh Steeler. Played in the Super Bowl. He's got three rings and one from the USFL. So Michigan's got the ball and a two-touchdown lead. Watch the hit on Vincent White by number 76 defensive end John Banaszak. Here comes the hit right now. And here's where Vincent White loses the football right there. And watch for nose tackle number 98, Alan Hughes, to cover the ball for the Michigan Panthers. They are inside the 50-yard line. Good field position. Big job, Banasek. Most viable player in Super Bowl 13 with the Pittsburgh Steelers. 10-54, third quarter. First and 10 from midfield. A bear to Anthony Carter. Complete to the 30. Down inside the 25 and almost gets away. Two-string tackle by number 23. Nate Miller brings him down. Anthony Carter almost had himself another touchdown. This is one of the routes that is so effective for Anthony Carter as he runs a deep drag in route because once again, as soon as he gets into the open field, he has so much speed and so much open field ability that he can break one and many times take it the distance as he almost did there had it not been for a shoestring tackle by Nate Mill. There it is. He's running the, the crossing route. And look how he almost breaks it. It's a shoestring tackle by number 23, Nate Miller, that saves the touchdown. You know, Anthony Carter and Holloway, I think, get into the open area of the zone better than any receivers that you see this year. First and 10 from the 17, a pair looks for a Holloway complete at the end. They're going to down him on the one-yard line. a bear to Derek Holloway. Exactly as you were just saying, they have the ability to find the open area of the zone coverage. And you know, we talked about this earlier. You notice how they run their routes a little bit deeper than almost any receivers in the league? They run those curl ends at about 18 yards. And they run their sideline cuts deeper. They run their hooks deeper. And so once they get the ball, they are in good open field position. And both of them have the speed and, and looseness. And, uh, and the ability to break the big play in the open field. Not a bad secondary they're running against either. Denver has two all pros in the secondary. First and goal from the one. The setback, Cleo Miller, Terry Miller. Cleo Miller leads the way. Terry Miller follows him and scores. Left side, touchdown Michigan. His second touchdown of the day. And all of a sudden, Michigan is breaking it wide open. That looked like a replay of the last touchdown. Power play off the left side featuring Terry Miller. Let's see if the guard pulls. He does. There's the lead block once again by Cleo Miller. Tyrone McGriff pulling. Terry Miller just following his blockers into the end zone. Wayne Radloff, 265. Tyrone McGriff, 267. Chris Godfrey, 250. They followed him twice now, and it's worked both times for touchdown. Novobiovich. He is good as gold, and they have Denver down by three touchdowns now. And the crowd here of nearly 50,000 at Mile High Stadium doesn't like it one bit. High kick, taken on the two. John Arnold looking for the funnel. Finds it across the 20 to 25, tries to get outside. Takes it up to the 30-yard line before he's finally knocked out of bounds. Well, the hero of the 
today has been Terry Miller, and right now he's with Bob Bruce. Thanks, Tim. One touchdown last week, two touchdowns today in front of the, the hometown Colorado Springs. You got a lot of friends here today. Oh, definitely, and quite a few people that I'm familiar with from when I was in high school and, and even in college, and some of the gold players when I was with them last year. But it's just a great feeling to be ahead at this point. Tell me about the touchdown and the black. Well, what happened is uh, the team, the offensive line, just blew them off the ball, and then there's really nothing for me to do but get it across the line. Back upstairs to Tim and Lee. Terry Miller, five carries, 13 yards, two touchdowns. He has three touchdowns now this year. Ron Reed looking for help across the middle complete in the Michigan territory goes Leonard Harris, number 80. There's the old Texas Tech battery. It's Ron Reed's number 11 throwing the ball to his wide receiver, number 80, Leonard Harris. Harris is running a deep drag in route. However, I'm afraid, Tim, that a penalty is going to bring the ball back. It was Reeves who convinced the goal to go after Leonard Harris. Because he knew his routes from college. He's a little guy, 5'8 and 185, but he can fly. He's the fastest man on the team, even faster than Kevin Williams. Here's the call. 52, offense, holding, first down. That's Tommy Davis, the center out of Nebraska. That's a tough play. That is a tough call right there for the goal because they needed that first down. That's something that would have put them in excellent field position. And now they uh, are going to lose something because of it. Tommy Davis is a six-year veteran played for the Broncos, started every game for the goal last year. He should have known better. First and 20 for the 22 for Reed. And again they move. This time it's George Arno, another six-year veteran. The guard, and again they'll move the gold back. This is where a young guy like Ron Reeves really has to take charge and talk to his lineman. There, somehow their concentration. Ball start. Offense number 66. First down. Sometimes just a little thing like the way the quarterback calls cadence can have an effect on the offensive line. They get used to one uh, rhythm with a Craig Penrose, for example, then someone else comes in. It can throw you off just a little bit. Terrible mental takedowns, and all of a sudden, this huge crowd at Mile High Stadium is going silent. Concentration's been broken, and now it's first and 25 from the 17. The draw flow. Sydney. Harry Sydney picks up a few, but not many when they have that much yardage to make up. Harry Sydney has been pretty quiet today, Tim, but he is their best all purpose player. Good one out of uh, Kansas. Why has he been quiet? <laughs> I don't know. Let's go down and ask him. <laughs> He's not getting to talk much, I guess. Five carries, 17 yards. I'd say for him, that's pretty quiet. And then Williams comes to the bottom of the screen. The top is Elmer Bailey. The quarterback is Steve Ron Reeves. On the 19-yard line. Second down, 23. Pressure, backside. Throws across the middle, and the ball is tipped by John Corker, the linebacker. John Corker with good pressure on Reeves. I don't know if he made the, the tip, but I know he made the hit on Reeves. He made his presence felt. Reeves hit on the play by John Corker. Here is the sack man, number 57 out of Oklahoma State, 6'6", 235. Look at he jumps over the blocker right there, comes around on the blind side, and causes Reeves to throw a, a wounded duck up in the air. 28 and a half sacks in 1983. Shotgun formation for Denver now on third and 23. Across the middle, incomplete, thrown behind the receiver. The receiver with John Arnold. And that was a poorly thrown ball. Again, Michigan does so many things very well on defense. They mix things up. They give you different looks. They disguise the defense. They do things that you see in the NFL that this team really hasn't developed yet because of the lack of depth. Things like combination defenses, Cup, where they play maybe man-to-man -man on one side and zone to the back side, and they'll mix things up. Well, you're an all-defensive player yourself. What can that mean to a defensive player when you have that kind of sophistication? Oh, it gives you extra confidence, and it frees a lot of people up. John Corker, for instance, he knows when he's going. He's got other help coming. He's playing games inside. He's more sophisticated. He's got a better chance of coming free. All right. Steve Gortz to punt it away. And he needs a good one. Steve Gortz doesn't get a great one. Walter Batten will let it hit. Anthony Carter touches it. And Denver 
can't control it. All Denver had to do was fall on the football and recover it. And they knocked it out of bounds instead. So a great opportunity to get the football back on a turnover. And they blow it. They knock it out of bounds and Michigan will retain possession. The score remains the same with 7.46 in the third quarter. Michigan, 21. Goal. So Michigan still has the ball with a 21-0 lead. It wasn't a very wise play, Cup. Tim, this is not one of Anthony Carter's wiser decisions because, as you can see there, he's not in a good position to try to field the ball. And Hemphill comes along, and it looks momentarily like he's going to control the ball and keep it for the gold, but he never gains real possession. So because of that, Michigan regains the ball on the 44-yard punt. Holloway and Carter. The bottom of your screen, Carter goes in motion. John Williams, number 40 in the ball game now. He'll lead the way for Cleo Miller. Let's go back to New York now for a USFL report. And here is Jim Lampley. Been out in the Meadowlands, the New Jersey Generals have taken the lead over the Philadelphia Stars after a Kelvin Bryant fumble at the 42. 42 yard drive was climaxed by Maurice Carthen's one yard run. The key play of the drive, a 20 yard run by Herschel Walker to the one, and it's 14 7 Generals in the Meadowlands. Back to Tim Brandt in Denver. And it's second and nine here, Lamps to the 40 for the Michigan Panthers. Bobby Bear heated up in the first half, played well. The give, John Williams, his first carry of the day. Picks up some blocks on the left side. Bangs it out, fumbles near the 48-yard line. John Williams, who was listed as doubtful today because of an ankle injury, is normally the starting running back uh, for the Panthers and also has been effective as a return man for them. He's out of Wisconsin and uh, was a consistent player for them most of last season. Led the team in touchdowns last year with 13. 5'11", a 205 pounder. Coming into this ball game, he had 15 carries, 56 yards, and those are the feet of John Corker. Loves to put that logo on his spats. Loves to put his trademark on quarterbacks. You know, he had 28 and a half sacks last season. How'd he get the half? Hit one guy so hard they gave him a sack and a half. A sack and a half. A 28 sacks in one baggie. Score remains the same. 629, third quarter. Tim Brand and Lee Gross Cup from Mile High Stadium in Cupper as you look at the time remaining in the third quarter. How much pressure is on the goal now? Oh, a lot of pressure is on them. They've got to get the ball. They're in a catch-up posture right now, and so you got to figure that their game plan has changed from where they were back in the first quarter. They've got to get the ball back and go right to work. They were outspoken, almost cocky in the newspaper today. Third and one from the 48. Close to the first down goes Cleo Miller. You know, they were challenging Michigan as you read the newspapers and the comments that were being made and talking to the players before the game. I think a little bit of that was false bravado because they knew that they were going up against the defending champion. And uh, I, I think they wanted to get themselves into a real worked up state. Uh, Michigan has, has taken over, and they, they've done the things that they like to do. They've uh, they've moved the ball with the ball control running, and Abair has has thrown uh, some good pass drives today. You saw the graphic: eight straight wins for the Michigan Panthers. They won 13 of the last 15 games last year on the way to the title. Cleo Miller, great penny, gives him a good block in the left corner. David Stalls and Kelvin Newton come up to make the stop. But the old veteran Ray Penny was out there in a hurry, the pulling guard, 6'4", 256 pounder, and he can still run. Well, you talked about this earlier, Tim, but I think it bears restating that the team was one and four at, uh, early in the season. They went out and acquired three key offensive linemen, and that's when things really begin to turn around for them. And he's a veteran, too, played in two Super Bowls. Missed the 79 season after an appendectomy. Second and six from the 47. A Bear under a little bit of pressure plays to Carter. Carter complete. Tries to spin out of the hole of David Martin, but he can't do it. Martin holds on and drags him down, but it's another first down, Michigan. This is why they call him the Cajun Cannon. Now, this is really the, the frozen rope. He's throwing to the sideline, and this ball, even though it's a short pass, is really thrown as about a 30-yard bullet, and it comes out of here with a lot of authority. David Martin is right there to shut down Anthony Carter after he catches the ball. 
But that ball was perfectly thrown. Anthony Carter now five catches for 71 yards, nine yards on that last one, and he has a touchdown. The clock continues to tick at 4.16 in the third period. From the 38 now, Hebert's got room to work, gives it to Williams, up the middle. Inside the 35, they mark it at the 33-yard line. Ray Penny, number 74, the pulling guard, really gets a shot on number 57, John Bungarts, who is the leading tackler on the team, and that sets up the key trap play for uh, running back John Williams. They really execute the trap plays about as effectively as any team in the USFL. All the way at the bottom of your screen, AC, Anthony Carter out of Michigan at the top of your screen. The give again to Williams. He trips over A Bear, and A Bear could be shaken up. He's holding his knee. Obviously, a broken play. What a blow that is to the Panthers if he's seriously hurt. The backup quarterback would be Whit Taylor out of Vanderbilt. Had to be a broken play, Lee. Let's see if we can see where he trips. I think he had a collision with his running back, and I think they locked knees. I think he, John Williams and Bear hit each other's knees as he was handing off the ball. And, and usually with something like that, you figure it's just a bruise. It doesn't look to me like it's torn ligaments or cartilage damage. No, it's something that could keep him out of action for the rest of the afternoon. No, you're right. It looked like they just banged these, and hopefully it's just a bruise. A Bear, 14 of 23, 158 yards and a touchdown. He leads the game, and that's the man we were just telling you about. Number 10, the youngster out of Vanderbilt, Whit Taylor. What a career he had at Vanderbilt. Sometimes likened to uh, Joe Theismann. And he had good mobility. That's quite a comparison, Joe Theismann. Mobile strong arm quarterback of the Washington Redskins. Third and eight from the 36 will be Taylor's first call. He's going to put it up, his first play. Across the middle, he's got a complete first down. Michigan, that's Mike Cobb. Mike Cobb, one of the leading receivers for Michigan, led the team in receptions last year with 61. And he has a reception in every game for the last 23. Quite a consistent performer, the drag across the middle. Interesting how all the new quarterbacks we've seen lately always seem to complete their first pass. Whit Taylor, straight drop back here. Mike Cobb on a crossing route. One thing about Whit Taylor, he has a lot of confidence. He throws the ball with a lot of authority. He's not afraid to go right to work. Cobb now three catches for 33 yards. Talented youngster came in last year, replaced Bear against Arizona in a 5 for 8 for 198 yards. Inside handoff, picks him up a few. That's Cleo Miller again. Early in the season against the Oakland Invaders, the same thing happened. Actually, he just, Bear was wild, and they put Whit Taylor in to settle things down. Then Bear came back later, and he was hot. Cleo Miller getting up slowly. Cleo Miller, new youngster, 10-year veteran. He will leave the ball game, and in will come Lenny Patrick, the rookie out of Alabama. So now the crowd comes to life on second and seven. The call goes up the defense. Denver shows zone. Patrick will carry it. And he gets up close to a first down. John Bungarts make the stop. But again, he's following Radloff and Tyrone McGriff and Chris Godfrey on the left side. Let's find out about Bobby Hebert and the extent of that injury. Here's Bob Bruce. Well, Tim, he has a bruise just above his right knee, and the trainer says that it is giving him a little pain, but he should return for the next series. Back upstairs. Okay, Bobby. So Bobby Hebert will be back in. Well, that's good news, and just as we said, we predicted that it was a bruise based on the collision with his running back, John Williams. Ogren makes the tackle. Steve Johnson is there as well. Lenny Patrick says he's got the first down, Michigan. But there is a flag. And it's against Denver. Let's 
there's the infraction right there, Tim, and it's blatant. Number 72, Steve Johnson, crosses the neutral zone prematurely. That's a fancy way of saying he was offside. Defense, number 79, offside, results in the first down. Denver's big defensive end, Dave Stalls, has come out of the ball game. He's on the bench, he's shaken up, and the trainers are working on him. Dave Stalls, the starter last year with Tampa Bay, was released, came to Denver. Oakland asked if they could use him. And the Los Angeles Raiders, rather, asked if they could use him. But Denver said, sure, and he played the Super Bowl. Again, the play is whistled dead as Lenny Patrick goes in for the touchdown and slams it anyway, but it'll be called back. This time is against the Panthers. What did you call Stalls? The Lend-Lease Lineman. I like that. The happy accident of alliteration. Of a, I like that very much. be a nice way to go. Offense number 51. First down. You've really become quite the word merchant. <laughs> there is George Dixon. Oh, he's an outstanding coach. Look what he's done with Bobby Hebert and the receivers. Coach guys like... Larry Brown with the Washington Redskins and Billy Kilmer. Fine teacher. Coached at Notre Dame with the Notre Dame. Whit Taylor wants time out to talk things over on first and 15. Michigan Panthers are sitting on the 16-yard line with 44 seconds remaining in the third period. And they are trying desperately to break this game wide open and put another seven points on the board. Greg Morton, who took over for Red Miller late last season, is 3-0 playing in this stadium, but that now, of course, in jeopardy against the Michigan Panthers. He trailed by three touchdowns. Denver has not had a first down in the second half. Panther offensive line has been dominating. Lenny Patrick, John Williams, the setbacks, a bear back in the ball game, and he's going to throw across the middle. Incomplete intended there for Anthony Carter. That almost looked like it was a catchable pass by A.C. Looked like if he had extended himself a little bit more, he might have caught this ball. Let's watch him isolated here. He's running a post route. He's guarded by Nate Miller, number 23. He has a step on Miller. Now watch right here, because I think Carter extends himself a little bit prematurely. Had he run a little bit longer, maybe one or two more steps, he might possibly have caught that ball. Well, you old quarterbacks are really tough on receivers. You say that every week. A bear on second down is taken down by Craig Birkin on the sack. Big defensive play. Craig Birkin out of Northern Arizona, 6'4, 230 pounder, had the big play against, or had the big play last week to set up the winning touchdown. Greg Gerken, the uh, right outside linebacker, number 50, is on the blitz. Looks momentarily like Hebert is going to have time, but right there, Gerken really comes in on his blind side and up ends it. Boy, that was a shot. Third time Hebert has been sacked this afternoon for 32 yards and losses. He still holds the trump card, though, with 21 points on the board. Lenny Patrick. Lenny Patrick out of Alabama, the rookie was recruited there by Bear Bryant. Did not carry the ball until this afternoon. He was on the developmental squad. United States Football League, Michigan Panthers and the Denver Gold. They will continue after this message and a word from our local stations with the score. Michigan 21, Denver nothing. Bojovic is on to attempt the field goal, and you have to wonder, Cupper, how much the early misses by Brian Spielman for Denver hurt the goal. This is a 42-yard attempt. It's long enough, but it's wide right for Novo Bojovic. And so the Denver gold has held and they get the ball back. Maybe he better put the garlic back in his shoe. <laughs> Been a long week for Novo. 
Novo Bojovic takes a little bit of a shot here, right here. Now that potentially is roughing the kicker, Tim. It didn't affect the kick, though. I mean, the kick was away. After he gets a little uh, whiff of that garlic, he won't come so close the next time. It's been a long week for him. He got married on Monday. Not much of a honeymoon. First down for the goal. First pass incomplete, intended for Leonard Harris. Michigan is pretty much dominated. Tim, as you look at the third quarter numbers, look once again how the time of possession figure. They are now twice. They are two times as great in times of the term of time of possession as the gold. And look at the total yardage now, 237 to 103. Once again, Denver has not had a first down here in the second half. Ron Rees in second and 10 from the 25. Michigan defense drops off, play zone. Reeves with time, going for Harris. Incomplete, and again, the crowd wants pass interference. Incidental contact, Ron Osborne was the defensive back. Clarence Chapman was there, and they almost sandwiched Leonard Harris. The old Texas Tech battery of Ron Reeves to Leonard Harris. Here is Harris taking an inside move. He breaks up the field, makes a little head fake to the inside, breaks it back to the corner, and now here comes the defensive back, two defensive backs, Ron Osborne, number 23, and also number 22, Clarence Chapman, the cornerback right there. No contact. Looked like contact to me, third and 10 from the 25. Shotgun formation, Reeves, plenty of time. Drops it across the middle, incomplete, intended for Vincent White, and the ball was almost intercepted. Will Copley had a shot at it and couldn't hold on. Let's go down now to Bob Bruce. Well, uh, Bobby. Bobby had somebody and they got away from him down there on the sidelines. Slippery. You know, Dave Stalls played against Craig Wharton one time in their play career in the NFL. He said it's great to have a coach and know that you had at one time took a shot at him, got a good shot at him, and got away with it. And right, was successful, that's right. Gortz doesn't get a high punt away, but it is a good long one, and it's dropped. Walter Bouton couldn't hold on, so there's no return. Recovery by Walter Bouton. 47-yard punt, no return. Well, Craig Morton had what he called the plan. He wanted to win his first two games and come back home for the first home opener here against the Michigan Panthers, the defending champions, and put 50,000 people in the seats here at Mile High Stadium. We haven't gotten the official attendance yet, but there is a good, solid crowd here. He's got a shot at it. Part of a campaign called Solid Gold Sunday. And they've had your troubles this afternoon. First and 10 from the 29. The Michigan Panthers, the quarterback, Bobby Bear. Blitz coming from the goal. Williams, left side, picks up some blocking, finds the funnel, gets out to the 38. Tom Sullivan had to come out of the secondary to make the stop. John Williams looks pretty healthy to me. They said he had a sprained ankle coming in, but it's taped and he's running well. Tom Sullivan has been busy at his free safety position today. That's good news and bad news. Usually when a, when a safety man is making that many tackles, you means that uh, they're opening some holes in the line. That's a good cut right there. See that cut right there by John Williams? That's what sets it up and, and gets him free into the secondary. And number 32 free safety man Tom Sullivan comes up there and meets him head on. And he gets the first down. You know, one thing that the, the backs have been doing all afternoon very well for Michigan is blocking for each other. There's a good block there by Miller. You know, the, this, this foursome, uh, of course, Ken Lacey is not here today, but when he's healthy, you figure Lacey, Williams, Miller, and Miller. That's a real good uh, combination of running backs there. And you look at the skilled people, the wide receivers, and you have a big tight end like Mike Cobb, the leading receiver, and a strong offensive line. Tough team in the weakest division. Three expansion clubs there, and Michigan's dominating. Could be 3-0. 13-0-3 remaining. Williams is high-stepping, still going. Picks up one. They never got him down. What an effort. 
He ran 25 yards to game one. John Williams. A flag was thrown, face mask was called, and they moved it back against the Denver Gold. So everything's going the way now of the Michigan Panthers. You know, Cup, I saw a report which said the NFL Players Association has budgeted $25,000 to help the players in this league to start a players union. I read that same thing. Why not? You know, it's uh, in their best interest, I guess. The USFL offers an alternative, a viable alternative to what was a monopolistic situation. First and one from the 48 for the Panthers. Bear to Anthony Carter, complete. Across midfield, down to the 40 to the 38-yard line. He's ridden out of bounds there by Nate Miller. Busy day in the United States Football League. Big crowds. Jim Lampley told you about that. Memphis Showboats now trailing the New Orleans Breakers 27-14 in the third quarter. Marcus Debris, a pair of touchdowns. Houston Gamblers leading the Chicago Blitz 31-29. Oklahoma leading San Antonio 7-0, third quarter score. And a good one to Keith Jackson and Lynn Swan are doing in the East. New Jersey leading that one 17-14. First down, give to Miller. Oh, that's Lenny Patrick back in the ball game. The rookie out of Alabama. He's getting a lot of work now. Didn't have any carries coming into the ball game, but he's, he's been kept busy. Good opportunity for him to get some professional experience because uh, he's a young man with a lot of potential. He was rated the second best high school player to Herschel Walker when he was recruited by Bear Bryant. Now has three carries, ten yards. Can that be right? Looks like he has more. Birmingham Stallions leading the Pittsburgh Maulers 24-6. Big day for Cribs. We saw him break loose last week, getting his rhythm. Good stout. Tough return to Pittsburgh for him. From the 36, second and eight, Anthony Carter wide open. Watch him dance inside the 25 to the 23-yard line. There is a flag, looks like a face mask. Tom Sullivan says, who, me? Anthony Carter, who caught nine passes the last time he was in Mile High Stadium for the championship game, makes catch number seven, and it's his favorite route, the sideline cut right there. He rounds it off, comes back toward the ball. Abar throws a bullet. Seven catches now for 98 yards. And uh, right here's the face mask right there by number 13 of the Denver Gold. That is uh, David Martin, the left cornerback. They're going to mark it off against him. Martin grabbed A.C.'s face mask, and then A.C. turned around and grabbed his. <laughs> Unnecessary roughness. Defense number 32, a late hit. First down. I'll tell you something about Anthony Carter. He may only be 5'11", 162 pounds, but he really doesn't take anything off the defensive players. Look at this now. He gets his grab right there, so he reaches out. <laughs> now watch. You see right there in the middle sure. of the screen. He grabs out and gets Miller's face mask. Sure. But the official was blocked, and so he didn't see what A.C. was doing. From the 14, first and 10, Bobby Bear Has two tight ends. Split backs. One wide out. Denver jumps. John Williams has a block from the corner. Turns it outside to the 12-yard line. Anthony Allen bumps him out of bounds there. John Williams showing no effects of the injured ankle that we heard about as we look at Jim Stanley. Underneath ball handling here, look at it. Bear gets some depth, hands the ball back underneath. McGriff, number 61, the pulling guard, leading the way. Good timing, a little hesitation, juke step, a move to the outside. And that helps John Williams pick up some valuable yardage as he's brought down by Dumars and Martin along the sidelines. Michigan knocking on the door one more time, trying to close the door on the Denver Gold. Second down, seven yards to go for the first. Lenny Patrick inside the 10 to the six. They have been effective that way on their drive. They have used up seven, 10, seven. Looks like they're gonna use up about another seven minutes or so on this drive. They've been able to keep the ball and move it toward the end zone. Don Eckers, Mike Cobb, the two tight ends. 
Third down, two. Patrick, first down, first and goal, Michigan. Boy, Kelvin Newton, John Bungarch, Jeff Harper, and Greg Durkin, the linebackers for Denver, have had quite a workout. I'm telling you, that Michigan line fires out of there. Well, they were the premier offensive line in the USFL last year, and even though uh, Tom Dornbrook is First out down. for the year with an injury, they're still very the strong. 255 pounds is Osmond, Ray Penny, 256, Radloff, 265, McGriff, 267, Godfrey, 250. That's they, been the key to the game. They have been in charge of the line of scrimmage. They know the difference between come here and sick them. I like it. First and goal from the two. Williams over the top. Gains one will be short of the touchdown. You know, the game has gotten very sophisticated, and certainly there's a lot more terminology and nomenclature than there ever was when I was playing. But it really gets back down to the fact that it's a, it's a simple game. It's a game of blocking, and it's a game of tackling. And ultimately, the team that controls and dominates the line of scrimmage usually wins. That's a good point. Good point. Michigan has held the ball for well over 12 minutes in the third quarter. All right, look at just what we were talking about. Look at how Michigan just really blows in there and gives uh, the back a chance to, to uh, dive over the line. And here in the fourth quarter, they've held the ball most of the day, most of the time. John Williams, touchdown. Again, the Panthers win the battle of the line of scrimmage. John Williams just uh, dives over for the touchdown. The Denver players don't think he got in. All, all you have to do is break the plane of the goal line with the football. Slant off left tackle. He dives right here. Walks right here. See that right there? Second right effort. Second effort is where he breaks the plane of the goal line with the football. Bajovic to make it a 28-point lead. And he does. Extra point is by no Lobo Perfect on the extra points. And John Williams has the touchdown. So right now, the Michigan Panthers lead at 28 to nothing with 834 left from Mile High Stadium. The Denver Gold has never been shut out. The Michigan Panthers have never had a shutout. But with eight minutes and 34 seconds remaining in this one, we could have some firsts. Craig Morton frustrated as he paces the sidelines there. Up until now, his plan has been working. Lubovic to kick it off for Michigan. Leonard Harris, Anthony Allen, and John Arnold, the deep men. As Leonard Harris, the speed strat of Texas Tech, gets some blocking, finds the corner, takes it up across the 30 to the 33-yard line, maybe up to the 35. Very nice return by Leonard Harris. You know, Harris led the Southwest Conference in punt returns and kickoff returns in 1983. Very nice return there. Look at the Michigan drive there. Ten plays, 71 yards. Time of possession again. Five minutes, 28 seconds. One-yard scoring run by John Williams. They have scored now in every quarter. See the baseball infield there, the home of the Denver Bears. and 10 from the 34-yard line. Ron Reeves is your quarterback for the Denver goal, trying to set up a little screen pass to Harry Sidney, but nobody's fooled. The Michigan linebacks are there. Let's go downstairs now. Here's Bob Bruce. I'm with Ray Finney, a man with not one but two Super Bowl rings from his years with the Steelers. Ray, from midway the first quarter on, you and your linemates have just been dominating. We've been pretty intense all week. Coach Stanley was... Uh, really harping on us all week to have a complete game and uh, play all four quarters. I think we came out uh, uh, determined to do that, and, um, you know, we're playing good today. You're normally a tackle, but you're playing guard because of injuries. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting used to guard. This is my third game now, and uh, I think we're starting to work together as a team a lot better. So, Tim, no matter how you shuffle the cards, the Michigan Panther offensive line just comes up strong. I'll tell you what, Bob, he may be a guard and tackle, but he's caught a touchdown pass here. He's caught a touchdown pass with the Steelers, and Chuck Knoll made him a member of the China Dial Club, which was 
a club that they usually hold for the fragile Steeler receiving core. Lynn Swan knows about that. Uh, <laughs> China Dog Club. Another flag. Things getting sloppy now. Mentioned the baseball infield. The Denver Bears play here. Vern Law, the manager. But coming up March 31st. Offense. Checking down. Coming up March 31st, they're going to have a big league game here. The Boston Red Sox come to town to play the Padres. This club, the Denver Gold, will benefit from that, as a matter of fact, because they're going to put down new side. Part of the agreement, the Bears have to do that. Seven minutes, 12 seconds remaining in this ball game from Mile High Stadium. Second and 16 from the 28 for the Denver Gold. Michigan shows blitz. They bring Corker and Borland. Look out. Bethea takes him down. Larry Bethea. Tempest Flair. These clubs love to get after each other, and I think right now Denver is extremely frustrated. Larry Bethea, 6'5", 245-pounder, played for the Dallas Cowboys, backed up Dutton Martin, two tall Jones, and an old teammate of mine, Randy White. A look here at the work of the defensive secondary of the Panthers, and watch the coverage. Nobody open. And that's why right in Larry Bethea, number 79, goes in and gets the hit on quarterback Ron Reeves. Look at this, Cup, they're playing man-to-man -man on the far side of the field. You've got the free safety up here just playing center field. And they brought the blitz and played games. Look how fun. disciplined they are with their coverage. Boy, Reeves was not ready for that snap. And he throws deep, incomplete. Good coverage by Bobby Futrell. Again, there are flags on the field. And it was intended for Elmer Bailey. That could be offensive pass interference. Bobby Futrell, number 20, covering wide receiver Elmer Bailey, number eight. Bailey's trying to run a corner route. Now watch right here, and let's see if the contact is offensive or defensive. I think maybe it is. Uh, it, no, my original thought was correct. I, I think that Bailey, number 83, pushed off Futrell. I'm not so sure it's pass interference. There was a lot of motion on the line. Reeves was not expecting the snap. Here's the call. Defensive pass interference, number 20. Illegal motion, offense, number 86. Repeat the down. Well, we were both right. <laughs> I like that. Isn't that fun when you I both like get it. to be right at the same time? I like it, Cupper. Hi, Bob. Hi, Vic. John Williams had a fine afternoon as the running back for the Michigan Panthers. Again, Michigan shows blitz. This time they jumped too early. I think Corker made contact. Reeves is in trouble. He will run out of bounds. And he's hit out of bounds. That'll be roughing the pass. Here come the gold. Unnecessary roughness against the Michigan Panthers. John Corker, I think, the linebacker will be called for that. You see him jump here. He, he made contact. Jumps outside right there, makes the contact. Reeves now running for his life, heads for the right sidelines. And watch what happens as he gets over here near the out-of-bounds marker. All right, that's Alan Hughes. Alan Hughes, number 98, pushes him. And then here comes Corker again, and he hits him out of bounds. How many times have you seen a player get two flags in one play? <laughs> that's why they call him the sack man. He's determined to get quarterbacks. I tell you, that's how you can get a quarterback hurt, though. Ron Reeves knows it. He's not happy about it. Corker, 28 and a half sacks last year, has yet to get one this season. He had a multiple foul. The offense on the defense. He had a personal foul out of bounds. Then takes the personal foul. So the personal foul takes precedent over the lesser foul, and they're going to mark it off against Michigan. Jim Stanley. You see there, some of the adjectives used to describe him, reserved, pensive, caring, honest, trustworthy, and a stickler for loyalty. As we mentioned earlier, played for Bear Bryant at Texas A&M back in the uh, mid-50s. He's had a lot of coaching experience, but most noteworthy, you think of him as, as a head coach at Oklahoma State 
where he had some great years and also had some NFL experience as an assistant coach before taking over as head coach for the Michigan Panthers last year. While at Texas A&M, he played with Jack Pardee, a new coach in this league. John David Crow there, too. From the 33, Reeves in a shotgun formation. First down, again, Michigan shows blitz, then drops off into a zone. Reeves has some room under the linebackers. And he gets nailed. Kyle Borland, the linebacker, came up to make the stop. The linebackers had dropped into their hook zone and then came up. Frustrating day for Reeves. Birmingham Stallions now lead Pittsburgh 24 to 12 in the fourth quarter. Big day for Joe Cribbs, 145 yards and one touchdown. Rozier, eight carries for 24 yards. It'll take him time. It'll take him time. Houston over Chicago, 38-29 in the fourth quarter. I like the way Jim Kelly is moving that team. Took Marshall Walker some time last year. It'll take Rozier some time to get acclimated. Second and three from the 40. Way overthrown. Almost intercepted by Clarence Chapman, number 22. <laughs> Intended for Elmer Bailey. Reeves has a strong arm, as did this man, Craig Morton, out of the uni University of California. Ray Pirelli, there's two legends right there side by side. Two quarterbacks, Craig Morton and uh, Vito Bay Pirelli out of the University of Kentucky. Bay Pirelli had a head coaching job back in the days of the World Football League with the old New York Stars, and the following year, he, he switched over and he was with the Chicago Wind. The Chicago Wind, you're bringing them out of the, the back pocket now, couple 74 and 75. Third and three, 531 in the ball game. That's Bo Matthews. Bo Matthews out across the 45 to the 46 yard line. Kyle Borland. Makes the stop along with Robert Pennywell. Michigan does have some outstanding linebackers. Come on, you're working on it. Kyle Borland, of course, was the roommate of David Greenwood at Wisconsin. John Williams played on that team, too. We the, the Badgers are well represented here. Robert Pennywell, Ray Bentley, John Corker, Kyle Borland. What a set of LBs, linebackers. 632. down for the Denver Gold from the 47. Elmer Bailey in motion. Reeves under pressure. Complete. That's Victor Hicks. And he rambles down to the 31-yard line into Michigan territory and again. Tempers flare. Victor Hicks is really having some words now with David Greenwood. This has been the most effective route for tight end Victor Hicks, number 87. Inside release, down and in. This ball is well thrown by Reeves. Kyle Borland put the pressure that time on Reeves. He had to get it away in a hurry. Look at how Reeves, uh, Vic Hicks moves here in the secondary. He played on a national championship team at Oklahoma back in 1975. He replaced Bob Nizolik, who was the starting tight end. John Arnold in motion. The fake give to Sidney. Time. Now he throws, and again, it's Victor Hicks. Complete inside the 30, down to the 26-yard line. So Denver may get on the board yet. Ron Reeves shows me that he has a strong arm. He's throwing the ball today with a lot of authority, despite the fact that he's been under a lot of duress. He replaced Craig Penrose, and if you're joining us late, we told you earlier that Penrose was hospitalized earlier in the week with the flu. He had fever, congestion, was feeling generally run down. He looked a little lethargic in the first half, although he did have some impressive numbers. But Ron Reeves now, I think, is throwing the ball with a lot of authority. And Victor Hicks is shaken up. 62 yards, four receptions, the leading receiver for Denver. So while the Michigan Panthers try to hold on to the shutout that they worked so hard for, and the Denver Gold will try to get on the board, we'll be right back. The 
Denver Gold. She Failing 28 to nothing, Cupper, but I'll tell you, they have not dampened the enthusiasm here. The fans in the Denver Gold, the pure gold right there. She is one of a group of cheerleaders, one of uh, a group of 24 cheerleaders known as Pure Gold, led by Miss Twirl. The attendance this afternoon, 41,623 at Mile High Stadium. They've been making some noise, too. The Denver organization has to be happy with that. They'd be happy with a touchdown. 315 remaining in the ball game. This is second and six from the 26. Reeves across the middle, complete. Elmer Bailey inside the 15. So Ron Reeves continues to play quite well at a Texas Tech. What a player he was in high school. State High School Player of the Year two years in a row before he went on to be a four-year starter at Texas Tech. First and ten, they mark the ball on the 13. Mike Kern drops off now, goes in motion. Looking for the slant and pattern incomplete intended for Elmer Bailey. He threw that into coverage. Linebackers took a good drop that time, but they were right in the way. Namely, those linebackers are Corker and Coakley. Let's watch. See right there? It was Corker who got a hand on the ball. He got his left hand on the ball as Reeves tried to throw a deep slant in. What an athlete John Corker is. Kicked around the Houston Oilers, did not get the opportunity he thought he would get there. Came and rejoined here with Jim Stanley, his former coach at Oklahoma State. And now he's playing as well as he ever has. Here he comes on the blitz. Again, Reeves goes across the middle, and this time it's underthrown. Leonard Harris almost caught on the bounce. There is a flag, and I think they're going to call it against the defense. is running at an in route. There it is, underneath. Leonard Harris, number 80, trying to work his way clear. And Oliver Davis, number 21, is going to get called right there for interference. It was not a smooth pattern. He ran into John Arnold, his own man, as they crisscrossed. He should have hesitated more and let it clear out for him before he came underneath. Defensive pass interference, number 21, half the distance to the goal line, first down. 21 is Oliver Davis, seven-year veteran out of Tennessee State. Played with the Browns and the Bengals. Played in Super Bowl 16 against the San Francisco 49ers. His rights for the Panthers were acquired from the Denver Gold, of all things. New fade pattern, right side, flag fly get incomplete. Leonard Harris was the intended receiver. Again, I think they're going to call interference. The fade route is the ultimate touch and timing route. Let's listen. Holding against number 22, the defensive back Clarence Chapman. I think he just grabbed on because he figured he was going to get beat. It's a smart thing to do. A lot of times the defensive backs are taught to do that. Defensive holding, number 22, automatic first. You know, with the new pass interference rule in NCAA football that's going to be going into effect this season, I think you're going to see a lot more of that. You know, pass interference now is going to be an automatic 15-yard penalty no matter where it is on the field as long as the ball is thrown over 15 yards. The Denver goal trying to avoid the shutout. First and goal from the four. Harry Sidney, right side, taken down immediately. No blocking, the blocking broke down. Greg Fiesel, Matt Miller didn't clear it out the way they should have, and John Corker was there. Harry Sidney, who is normally their most productive back and their best all-purpose player, has not been particularly active today. He's running from the eye back right here. Tries to get loose around the right side. And look who's there. John Corker, number 57, came all the way from the back side. He's an amazing player. He's really at the peak of his form right now. Faster than gossip. John Corker. Well, that's a two-minute warning. First and goal from the five for Denver when we come back. 
A reminder that the Pro Bowlers Tour will be seen on the West Coast, 3.30 Pacific time here at Mile High Stadium in Denver. First and goal from the five for the goal. Reeves, under pressure. Allen Hughes knocks it loose. Big Allen Hughes came through in a hurry. 6'2", 260 pounder out of Western Michigan. Well, Larry Bethea gets close to the ink, but this guy, number 98, Alan Hughes, is a player at his nose guard position. Watch how he penetrates right here. It comes around the blind side of Ron Reeves and knocks him high and hard and makes him uh, lose the football right there. However, his arm was in motion, so it's going to be ruled an incomplete pass. Great speed by that guy, Alan Hughes. Ran right around the center, Tom Davis, in the offseason. Hughes is a bodyguard for Thomas Hearns. Hit man. So are they calling roughing the passer? Well, I tell you, I think they were calling holding again on Oliver Davis. It remains first down. First and goal from inside the five at the three. Keep in mind, Denver goal. The team has never been shut out. And Michigan has never had a shutout. Reeves under pressure again. And he'll go down again. Kyle Borland, the linebacker. 6'3", 238 pounder out of Wisconsin. We've talked about him all afternoon. They've got some active linebackers and they utilize them. They bring them from every part of that defense. Michigan doing such a good job here with their goal line defense. It's play action. Fake to Sydney. Now watch number 52, Kyle Borland, come around here as Reeves is trying to find an open man, and there isn't anybody open. And he just ducks under number 52, Kyle Borland, out of the University of Wisconsin. Second, and goal from the 14, intercepted John Corker to the 20. 25, knocked out of bounds on the 30-yard line. John Corker. It was the quarterback, Ron Reeves, that ran him out. can play. We said it earlier, this guy plays wall-to-wall -wall linebacker, defensive player of the year in the USFL last year. John Corker with the interception, and Michigan holds on and it's close to a shutout. 116 remaining. There he is, big John Corker. 22-yard interception return moments ago. Whit Taylor's the quarterback from Michigan. Hands the ball off to John Williams. They'll now run the clock out with 108. The important thing to remember, Tim, is that John Corker missed the Denver game last season. That might be one of the reasons the Gold won that game at the Silverdome. As they were backed up against their old goal line there. First and goal from the four. You know, there was a lot of pride on that defense, trying to sustain the shutout, and that's the first thing Corker said. We saw him on the sidelines, and he said zero. They didn't even score. He held up a goose egg. Talented athlete, John Corker. Second and one from the 40, 37 seconds left. The goal, come with the blitz, try to shake up Whit Taylor, and he overthrows his receiver, number 82, Frank McLean. Hey, for the United States Football League. The game we saw last night, Tampa Bay, 51,274 there. Philadelphia, New Jersey has 46,000. And in New Orleans, 45,000 in excess plus. Michigan, Denver here at Mile High Stadium, 41,623. And Oklahoma, over 23,000. And the Houston-Chicago game has 7,000. Big weekend as you look around the United States Football League. Patrick picks up another Michigan first down. So the Denver Gold will have to go back to the drawing board. Greg Morton has been undefeated as a head coach here at Mile High Stadium until this afternoon. And this was a big ball game for them. He had pushed his plan to try to fill the stadium and get 50,000 in here. He got 41, but they didn't give the fans much to yell about this afternoon. So this is the first hitch in his plan. As you say, he's going to have to regroup. 
go back to the drawing board. However, I don't think he's going to make any radical changes in his basic coaching philosophy. It seems to be working. Michigan Panthers extremely strong, remain unbeaten. They are now 3-0 in the Central Division. That a division with three expansion teams of the five in Michigan, of course, the class of that outfit. The defending champion, Michigan Panthers, who won the title here 24-22 against Philadelphia just last July 17th, gets another win at Mile High Stadium. Michigan 28, Denver nothing. Pretty good, pretty good little shot there of the two coaches talking. Good look at what we talked about at the very top of the show. Two outstanding coaches with contrasting philosophies. Jim Stanley, of course, going back to his origins with Bear Bryant. Craig Morton, an 18-year veteran in the NFL, learned a lot and learned a lot of the things he liked and didn't like. He's got speed, he's got size, he's got talent, he's got names, and he's got the defending champions playing extremely well. Michigan 28, Denver nothing. The final score in Denver. We'll be back. Now we welcome those of you who have been, and now we welcome, at this moment, those of you who have been watching the Michigan Panthers in their 28 to nothing victory over the Denver Gold, the first really overpowering performance of the season for the Panthers who won the USFL championship, as you know, a year ago. Let's take a look at what happened in that ball game, an orchestrated display of Michigan's power. In the first quarter, Bobby Hebert threw this touchdown pass to Anthony Carter from four yards out. It was 7 nothing. Mark that early in, the, or that was actually in the first quarter. Then in the second quarter, this one-yard touchdown run by Terry Miller made it 14 to nothing for Michigan after a drive which ate up nearly 10 minutes. In the third quarter, Miller scored again. One yard out, it was 21 to nothing, Michigan. The last one-yard touchdown run of the game was from John Williams, formerly of Wisconsin, and of course, a guy who had a terrific year for the Panthers a year ago. And Michigan was dominant on all fronts in that game as they went on to a 28 to nothing victory, their third of the season, and Denver drops to two and one. Interesting game today down in New Orleans where Marcus Dupree made his debut for the New Orleans Breakers. You'll remember that last year as the Boston Breakers, they were one of the toughest defensive teams in the league and they remain a good defensive team, one which has been playing well early in the season. Dupree scored on the very first carry of his USFL career after a Ben Needham fumble recovery early. Marcus took it in from a yard out and it was seven nothing New Orleans. But then the Memphis Showboats expansion team under the coaching of Pepper Rogers countered with this 15 yard touchdown run by Alan Reed to tie it back up at seven to seven. However, New Orleans had the answer for that one as once again, you'll see number 22 in the blue jersey on the sweep to the right and Marcus Dupree was making it look easy early in his USFL career, as on his first day in the league, he now had two touchdowns. It was 14 to seven. Once again, Memphis came back as Walter Lewis, who has started out the season very well for the showboats, runner, thrower, this time throwing to Cormac Carney, 30 yard touchdown pass. That tied it at 14. Just before the half, a 40 yard Mazzetti field goal for New Orleans made it 17-14, and John Walton got hot in the second half. First, this eight yard touchdown pass to Charlie Smith, that made it 24 to 14. Later, this Walton to Frank Lockett touchdown pass of 40 yards. Old John Walton doesn't throw it long too often, but when he does, he tries to make it effective. And now late in the ball game, New Orleans is leading in that one 37 to 14. So the Breakers are apparently headed for another victory. Fascinating game in Pittsburgh today where the Birmingham Stallions with Cliff Stout at the controls came into play against the Pittsburgh Maulers. Now, Pittsburgh fans are used to seeing Stout win on days when he throws terribly. That's happening again today, but they don't like it as much now with him in the Birmingham uniform. That 10-yard touchdown run for Stout made it 24-6. Birmingham in the third quarter, but then Carano to Potts, Sean Potts, made it 24-12 on a four-yard touchdown pass. Here's the man who's had a big day for the Stallions. Joe Cribbs went in on this touchdown run from 13 yards out to make it 30-12 Birmingham. He's got and this uh, touchdown by Walter easily narrowed it to 30 to 18. A couple of fascinating statistics from that game in sold out Three Rivers Stadium. Cribs, when last we checked, had 31 carries for 186 yards and two touchdowns. Mike Rozier's effort today, similar to his two previous ones, 10 carries, 25 yards, one fumble that set up a touchdown. Cliff Stout, late in the ball game, two of 15 in the air. Only 29 yards, one interception, but nevertheless, Birmingham appears headed for a victory in that one. Houston and Chicago, this is another big day for the Houston rookie, Jim Kelly. He has three touchdown passes. Late in the ball game, Houston leads it 38-36 over the Chicago Blitz. Most points ever scored in the United States Football League game, and as we mentioned, of course, 
Three touchdown passes for Jim Kelly. He was the player of the week in the league for his performance last week and has another strong one going today. San Antonio, Oklahoma, this has been a defensive battle, and the Oklahoma Outlaws lead the Gunslingers 14-7 in the fourth quarter. Los Angeles and Oakland. Today for the Los Angeles Express, former Kansas quarterback Frank Syrer started at quarterback. It is as yet indefinite what will happen to former UCLA star Tom Ramsey, who is still under contract to the Express. Steve Young may play next week. He is not going to play today. And that game is scoreless. And there are five minutes left before halftime now. We show it in the first quarter. They actually are in the second quarter. Last night, a couple of good teams met in Tampa Bay in the cross-state battle for the state of Florida as the Jacksonville Bulls invaded Tampa Bay to take on the Bandits. 51,274 in the stadium saw the Bulls pick off John Reeves' first two passes and jump out to a 12-yard lead on this Matt Robinson to Michael Whiting touchdown pass. Bandits cut the deficit to 12-7 on Gary Anderson's two-yard run and added a safety to make it, uh, or check it, that made it 12-0. That was Larry Mason's five-yard touchdown run for Jacksonville that made it 12-0. Now, there's the Anderson touchdown from two yards out that made it 12-7. A safety made it 12-9. And then watch this. Matt Robinson went in for a touchdown from a yard out to make it 18-9, but that play will prove costly for the Bulls. Robinson chipped a bone in his foot. He'll be sidelined from 10 days to three weeks. Tough break for Matt Robinson, the former NFLer who was playing so well for Jacksonville. Tampa Bay field goal made it 18-12 at the half. The Bandits came out firing in the third quarter. John Reeves finding Eric Trevillian with a 33-yard scoring strike. And then Tampa Bay struck again and took the lead for the first time, 25-18, on that nine-yard run by Greg Boone. Robbie Mafuz was at the controls for Jacksonville. And the Bulls came back to tie the game on Willie McClendon's six-yard run, opening play of the final quarter. Then Zen and Andrew Shishin kicked this 30-yard field goal with two seconds left. Keep the Bandits unbeaten and give them the bragging rights to the state of Florida for now. You know, of course, about the contract that Steve Young signed on this past Monday with the Los Angeles Express, 43 years in duration, a total of $40 million, a fascinating financial structure. Martin Wyatt of our owned and operated station KGO in San Francisco had an opportunity to talk to Steve later this week after the Express arrived in Oakland. Here's a look at that. The first question that most fans want to know, how how have you reacted to the amount of money that uh, from one day to the next day being a multi-millionaire? How does it affect you and the people around you? Well, I think it's really difficult. I'm, I think I'm a pretty sensitive person to those kind of things. And uh, uh, it was very, you know, still tough to try to react to it. And um, the only way I can even find a way to, to feel good about it is to feel like I can go ahead and, and help a lot of other people this way. Uh, Selfishly, I you know I could never do this. I'd have to just walk away and say, "Oh no, nah, I can't do this. I'll do something else." Mm. But uh, the only way I can really sort of put in my mind in, in the right perspective is that I can you know, use this to help many, many other people, and uh, and hopefully I can you know rectify that in my mind. It's been something that's taken some used to because I get used to because uh, it's it's <laughs> it's a big change. Not only. Uh, uh, the money but just the, the whole atmosphere of your life you know i had a lot of comfort zones at byu and things that were going on what about your teammates i mean that certainly had to be a concern of yours well that's still a concern and you know i, I really do feel like if uh, i don't feel like i'm having a good impact or something isn't working out well then uh, uh maybe i shouldn't be doing it it's uh this is team sport this isn't tennis this isn't golf it's something you got to get along with your, your teammates with and uh, be successful and so uh uh, you know, I'm just out there going to give it a try, and if it doesn't work out, then, uh, uh, then I, you know, I'll feel good about walking away from it because I gave it my best shot. But, uh, uh, you know, right now, it's, it's something that I'm really concerned about. The pressure to perform is always great on a quarterback because uh, win or lose, you're, you're going to either get maybe too much credit or too much blame. And the amount of money you make, maybe the highest paid guy in, in professional sports possibly, that's got to be a lot more pressure on you to perform <laughs> and to do it real fast. There's a, there's a tremendous amount of pressure, and I think um, uh, in a lot of ways it's, you know, uh, overwhelming uh, to a point that you're not, even myself, a confident person that I am, have to be start wondering, well, wait a second, you know, what, what, what do I need to be doing here? What's, what are my capabilities? And so I'm trying to work those things through right now. And hopefully we'll come to some, you know, to grips with it myself. So that as soon as I do, then I can just throw everything else aside and all the pressure that I feel outside and just put, 
you know, just do it internally. But, you know, right now I'm working with myself trying to get it all straightened out. Do you think uh, being a deeply religious man that it'll help you keep it in perspective? It'll always be in perspective, but it's a amount of uh, how what I really want in my life. And uh, I think that to a point you, you want to be successful, you want to take a challenge, but uh, many times uh, there are things that you just can't do. You, you try your best and, and uh, uh, that's all that I will do. And that's all I'll ever try to do. And so the religion will just, it will it will make me always keep perspective on it all and make sure that I don't get away from my uh, basic values. And I think in a lot of ways that's uh, what's being, you know, it's very difficult right now is I'm not sure that I'm following my basic values. And uh, so I'm trying, to, I'm trying to rectify all that in my mind right now too. One interesting note for any of you who may not follow college football carefully and therefore may not know a great deal about Steve Young, he's not just a quarterback in the technician sense, he's an outstanding athlete. This is a guy who was one of the fastest players on his team and had over 100 yards rushing in some games in which he passed for three or 400 yards. So unlike some other quarterbacks who are sheer technicians, this is a terrific athlete in addition to being an outstanding technician. Gil Brandt of the Dallas Cowboys was quoted this past fall of, as calling Steve Young the most accurate passer he'd ever seen. Now let's update a couple of scores. Birmingham and Pittsburgh are now final. The Stallions having won that 30 to 18. Cribs, 33 carries, 191 yards and two touchdowns. Rozier finished with 16 carries, 52 yards, the one fumble I mentioned earlier. And Stout, two of 16 for 29 yards and an interception. That's the winning quarterback. The loser, Glenn Carano, 18 of 33 for 221 yards and an interception. Also, Houston defeated Chicago 45-36. This is the second weekend in a row that the Blitz have been beaten by an expansion club and another outstanding performance for Houston's Jim Kelly and for running back Sam Harrell, who had three touchdowns in the game.